You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by MyAx, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. MyAx is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody, that music means it is Friday, it is noon central, it is 1 p.m. Eastern, it is time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we tend to think so, we're not biased at all, Options Insider radio network course available on just about every platform under the sun for the on-demand folks, if you want to go above and beyond Join us live. You know where to go. Theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. Remember, it's just a secret. Just you and me. Just talking here. Don't tell anybody else. <laughs> and of course, however you listen, live after the fact. Hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. And let's see who we're hearing from on the program today. First, let's go out to the southern volatility mecca known as Austin where we are joined once again by the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program. How are things in the Southern Volatility Mecca, sir? Well, you know, I was 80 degrees uh, last night. I sat outside and had tacos and watched my kids play on a playground. It was pretty nice. So it wasn't uh, 27 degrees and putting on the snow tires then is what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, certainly better than the market feels today right now. Certainly better than Apple's last two days. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's keep on rolling. Let's go out now. Joining us in the MyAx hot seat today, Mr. Matt McFarland, the derivatives, products, and biz dev specialist over there at MyAx. The guy, pretty much the futures guru over there at MyAx. Matt, welcome back to the program, sir. Good to be here this afternoon. A little bit colder than what they're experiencing down there in Austin, but uh, looking forward to talking some vol with you today. And because there's so much vol out there these days, listeners, three people, not enough to break it all down for you. So we added a fourth this week. Happy to have Mr. Jem Carson, the founder and senior managing partner over there at Kai Volatility Advisors, returning to the program here. Jem, welcome back to Volatility Views. A little bit of vol to talk about today, sir. You picked a good one. 
Thanks for having me, guys. I uh, I need my own nickname. I'm getting out here enough. For, <laughs> I don't know about the spicy meatball, but I'm waiting. We'll work on it. We'll workshop it behind the scenes here as we keep on rolling. It is time for the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down the week that was and indeed still is from a vol trading and trending analysis and unusual activity, all sorts of fun perspectives. And as I mentioned there in the intro, a little bit more vol to talk about today. Coming into showtime, we are seeing pretty much red across the board out there today, even though it's a little bit of a flipping of the script from what we saw yesterday. Yesterday, we saw the NASDAQ leading the charge into the dark side off over 2% at one point there. And the Dow was green to unched most of the day. We're flipping that script a little bit today. Coming into showtime now, we have the Dow leading the charge to the downside off about 1.3%. S&P off about 0.8%. And the NASDAQ kind of only a rounding error off of a 10th percent to the downside. So I guess taking a break from its excessive downside yesterday. Of course, all that red to end the week means we got vol mostly firming up across the board you know it seemed like for a while there earlier this week after powell spoke all that vol was coming out of the sales and now here we are last couple of sessions that vol starting to creep back in coming at the showtime vol a little bit lower than it was earlier in the session spikes when we kicked off the show was at about a 20 and a half that puts it still up but only up about three quarters of a point it was up well over a point earlier in the session vix cash same deal it was at about a 21 and a half when we kicked off the show that puts it up Right around two points, it was up more than that, obviously, earlier in the session as well. Uh, VVIX coming into showtime at about a 134. That puts it up a whopping 18 points <laughs> from where it was this time last week. Remember, this time last week, listeners, a lot of that ball was coming, screaming out of the tape there. And, of course, its counterpart, the Viking, a.k.a. V-Spikes, coming into showtime was at about a 165, almost 166. Puts it up a little over two points on the week. If you're wondering what the range it's had so far for the year. It's been a short year. Remember, it only listed back in late October, early November. Uh, but it hit a low of about 128. That was back in early November and hit a high of 201 just a couple of weeks ago back in the Omicron madness. So 165, kind of in the middle portion of that range right now. So a lot to unpack. Let's go around the horn. Let's go the opposite of the way we started. Let's go back out to Jim. It's been a little while, Jim, since you've joined us on the show. A little bit of all has popped up on the screen <laughs> since the last time you joined us. So maybe let's start there. What did you make of the initial Omicron madness that we saw a few weeks ago? Then, of course, the sell-off rally, sell-off rally that we saw after that. Then all the ball seemingly coming out. And now, of course, coming back to today, where the ball is apparently starting to come back in, Jim. A lot to unpack there. Yeah, so um, the, the Omicron news really, um, off, as often is the case, kind of the narrative follows price. Um, you know, we, after November expiration, uh, which is, you know, generally bid relative to everything else, had the Thanksgiving holiday ball, um, which was very suppressed broadly, uh, but particularly the indexes. Um, so this kind of led to a kind of a, a steady kind of continuation up when that plug, kind of that, uh, that linchpin was removed um, on the Friday, in a liquid Friday after that, that Thanksgiving kind of, uh, you know, week. Uh, we, you know, we obviously had that big kind of whoosh down that started. Um, that that really, you know, got some beginning of the month flows, to some first second that kind of supported the market, um, and then, you know, ever ever since then, we've, you know, had had kind of a back and forth. It's been a very, and this has been the case now, really for some time. It's been a really kind of tug of war, push and pull market. The vol flows, particularly in the indexes, have been very supportive, very well supplied. Uh, you know, people have been broadly hedged. Um, you know, that said, uh, you know, underneath the surface, I think we all know what's going on in single stock land. Um, you know, uh, a lot of stocks hit their highs in February. Brett has been awful. Um, you know, this is, you know, I think the, the most recent stat was only about 30% of, of NASDAQ stocks are above their 200 day moving average. Um, you know, so you've had a really, and, and you know, a lot of long short. The managers that I talk to, not in the vault space, uh, you know, having a real, real tough go of it. A lot of the, the most crowded hedge fund names, um, you know, are, are, are you know, underperforming the most. So 
you have some structural weakness underneath the hood and the ball, you know, complex has been broadly very supportive. So, um, you know, in particular recently heading into quad witching, obviously this morning, um, you know, you tend to get these very positive flows in, in the week and a half leading up. Um, really, you know, I prefer to be before, you know, our last meeting, which is, you know, our last conversation, which was, um, you know, these Vana flows, right, coming from the decay and skew in these big quarterly expirations um, were, were, have been significant, you know, um, particularly tied to also the Fed meeting that was on Wednesday. You know, that was very high ball. That's been priced in event ball. Uh, as that event ball comes out, as you've seen in many other times, uh, you see a, a big kind of push higher. Um, we got that big spike on, uh, you know, Fed day. Uh, not a surprise. There are several big players in the S&Ps. Um, one in particular, that, that about a 46 half, 47 half, 46, 50, 47, 50 call spread on the 20, in the East 23rd expiration, a big Delta player that's, that's kind of really good. Um, kind of front running from those line of flows, got a big positive move up, um, as, as we kind of would have expected. But again, then comes right back in kind of that structural weakness that's really tied to kind of that, that blood that we're seeing in the street, um, on all these kind of long, long, short kind of hedge fund names. So there's a lot of underlying weakness. Um, you know, there is structural where, where vol is less supportive, you know, in the NASDAQ on the downside. Um, and with the less of these Vana flows, structural flows, um, you're seeing not a, not a surprise kind of uh, dispersion, uh, you know, way way worse performance in those names relative to the indexes. And I, I think that's something that continues here uh, for some time going forward. So lots to unpack there, but you know, that's kind of what's been going on under the hood. Let me take it back really quickly to that day when it all popped off. Of course, November 26th, it's a thin day, Black Friday, so weird things can happen on days like that. But we saw this kind of first leg of this Omicron sell-off. Most of the major indices are off over 2%. Vol is popping across the board. Now, historically speaking, throughout most of the pandemic, when we got these vol pops outside of maybe March of 2020, they were pretty short-lived, and you had upside calls and things. You had to dump them pretty quick. We always joke here on the show, usually within a few hours, if not minutes. We saw something a little bit different with this sell-off, where the vol remained for the better part of that next week as we saw that you know next legs of the sell-offs and then rallies and sell-offs again. So I'm curious... What was going through your mind? We saw this first sell-off on Friday and then the subsequent sell-offs later on this week. Were you thinking that maybe this, this Omicron was going to lead to maybe a new structural regime of volatility? Or were you thinking this was mostly, mostly a short-lived phenomenon? Yeah, in our view, it's very much part of this broader context of the push and pull, knowing that you know, those big quarterly bond flows lie behind. And, and given how high that ball got, right? Um, you know, when you have these events when ball really pops, the, the the hurdle for which it you know the market needs to um, you know continue to the downside in order to avoid um, kind of the ball decay in this kind of fixed strike world the, the, the hurdle gets so much higher so um, you know we we felt very strongly that the amount of ball that got pumped in relative to the potential you know move that that we were possibly going to get added to the fact that there were these you know these positive flows coming on the back end you know the other side of that tug of war. Uh, you know, was likely to lead to a, to a big, bigger move up. And, and eventually we, we did get that. Um, you know, in particular, there was a lot of, uh, you know, stress like you see at the bottom in some of the skew uh, that, you know, we, we saw some, um, you know, December 30, uh, 3,800 puts, you know, trade on the offer that right at the bell um, on that reversal, you know, next day up. Um, you know, there was, uh, there were a couple of, of kind of margin kind of taps on the shoulder which we haven't seen in a while, that really led to some um, some really high skew. Um, it was really a, a skew event more than it was a ball event there uh, towards the end. And that's usually a very good sign that that you're at a reversal. Um, you know, uh, ball spiking is one thing, but when you really start to see skew and margin protection, um, you know, going to that, that's usually a very kind of short-lived end of the um, kind of stress. Um, so that's what we saw. And, 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 you know, sure enough, we got a reversal, but again, like I mentioned, there's a bigger structural tug of war going on behind the scenes. Yes, many tug of wars to be discussed here on the show. You probably do a whole show on just all the charm and vanna flows going on out there, but we have to keep rolling. Let's go back out now to the Mayax hot seat, Mr. Matt. A lot popping off. Every time you join us here on the show, uh, you've got some new updates in terms of what's going on over there in the land of the futures and indeed all the things you guys are working on over there at my act. So if you have that, have that. And also what's catching your eye out there from an overall vol perspective these days, Mr. Matt. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
You know, this is the time of year when you kind of look back uh, over the course of the year and take a, a broader view. Or, um, and as you look back over how the spikes index performed throughout 2021, um, it's a pretty interesting year. Um, you know, early in the year, we, we had the highest level it reached at 36.99 in January. Lowest level it reached was uh, 14 spot 83. That was in July. Uh, the average for the year, uh, 19 spot 86. Um, now, of course, we still have some time left in the year. And uh, 2018 taught us that certainly you can get some volatility around the holidays. But um, when you think about a you know an average spikes level of around 20 for the year um, uh, with the backdrop of a of a, a market that's uh, gained uh, over 20 percent, it seems like pretty high vol, uh, and it lends credence to the notion that COVID has indeed ushered in a new vol regime. Because if you think of the pre-COVID environment, when you have these type of gains, you're not you're not having an average. Uh, level of around 20 you're at, you're you've got handles at a, at 10 and 11 um but i think it's been an interesting year uh in terms of you kind of had a book and volatility events you know that when we reached that high in spikes uh back in january at about 37 and then this um, most recent uh volatility that we had earlier this month where spikes got up to about 36 I think the the key difference between those two events was the speed with which the uh, reverted to the mean. So back in January, it took you know till about mid March before you saw a spikes print below twenty. Uh, this this time around, you saw a spikes print under twenty within a within a week. That tells me that uh, although cover COVID is you know supporting volatility perhaps the market is uh the concerns about it are diminishing a bit well, let's go back out now to the southern volatility mecca hopefully he's he's finished up with mr taker his lessons on the tombstone pile driver for today are finished mr meatball sir what has been lighting up your tape in yet another crazy week out there for volatility yeah you know just uh, the movement in vol has been pretty astounding the bifurcation of the different indexes is really strange, right? We've got today the Russell 2000s up, and the Dow is down 1.2 percent. The Nasdaq probably looks like it might want to go green again, and I wouldn't be surprised if we got the S and P green. And Matt brought up a really, I think, salient and an important point because I didn't get to be on Vol Views last week, and and one of the things I wanted to kind of ask Jem about is. I don't, I, and, and Mark, you tell me whether you remember a time like this or Matt. I can't remember a period of time where the VIX went from, the VIX and the spikes went from above 30 to below 20 over the course of four days. And I, I can't think of a single period of that happening. What do you, th- and Jim, what do you, what do you think accounts for that? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, there is more leverage in the system now, right? Uh, This has been increasing for a long time, but really in the last year, year and a half, the amount of leverage in the system, the amount of, um, you know, not just economically, but in these capital markets with new participants is um, at all time highs. And what that ultimately does is, you know, if, if you have less leverage and two entities are are kind of the you know, buyers and sellers are, are are pushing against each other. The market may not go anywhere. Same may be true if you have two really even bigger positive and negative flows. They may not go anywhere. But the difference is it's a high potential energy environment. So when that that those imbalances kind of happen, there's much more potential energy under the scenes, and you get much bigger moves. This is it's a much more leptocritic environment than we've ever seen. Much more fat tails to the outcome. So balances are again <laughs> the tug of war is in Aussie, but we really are in this situation where there's two really massive kind of sumo fighters hitting at each other. When one splits, it, the, the momentum is, is way bigger than than it would be if it was kind of uh, you and I kind of uh, you know sumo wrestling in that ring. 
So there, there's, um, you know, I think that's a, a huge part of it. Um, on top of that, um, you know, we're at, uh, you know, historic kind of valuations. There's a lot of uh, negative kind of, uh, you know, you know, we're, we're amidst a historic, um, you know, pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, and a historic, right, uh, you know, money being pushed in the civic system and, and now being withdrawn. So, you you know, there's, there are big structural um, things going on behind the scenes. And so, um, and with that comes bigger hedging and the Von and Charm flows I talked so much about, more uh, more reflexive effects um, that, that underpin uh, the market. Um, and, you know, uh, hence you can get, uh, you know, kind of some real crazy uh, rotations. Again, I think the dispersion that we're seeing, that historic kind of rotation, you know, um, you know we see those in periods when, when ball is very well supplied on the index level, right? But yet there is real kind of stress underneath the hood, um, like we're seeing with, with the weak breath. So, um, you know, and also it's not just a volatile situation, but more importantly, a higher ball of ball situation, right? A, a circumstance where, and we've seen the ball of ball also breaking out, right? The VIX we've seen now is, is kind of reaching kind of historic kind of levels. Um, you know, we think that is actually accurate. We think that is, uh, that's how the market should be, uh, you know, adapting and positioning, um, as we enter this next year. I don't know, Jim, I think you had a good suggestion there. I think you and Mark Sumo Wrestling, I think we could sell a pay-per-view around that. What do you think? I'll be the ref. <laughs> Matt could be the yeah. timekeeper. I think I think we got a little bit of a side hustle going on here. What do you guys think? I, I don't think anybody wants to see us in a diaper <laughs> pushing bellies against each other. We could, we could go those big fat sumo suits that you see at like the county fair. How about that? We'll do that. <laughs> The, the meatball versus the croissant. There we go. There we go. Food based. See, there's a lot of ways we could pitch it. Volatility, sumo wrestling. Literally, no one has ever done that. We are breaking new ground here on the show today. I like that. All right. Before we dive deeper into silliness, let's keep on rolling here. Let's go out to the land. Matt was just talking about here out there the volatility futures, aka that vol surface where so many of the answers to all of our vol questions are lurking. If we can just find them through all the noise out there coming into showtime, obviously uh, the futures were a little bit up compared to where they were this time last week. Well, not a ton. And obviously, since the show has kicked off, they've come in a little bit even since then. Kicking off the show, that Dees future was up a little over a point, about 1.3 points from this time last week. And the Jan future up about exactly a point from this time last week. So that front portion of the curve remains a little bit juicy, a little bit frothy, but perhaps not quite as bid as you might have thought. Let's go back out to Mr. Matt. He is the... Major domo of all things futures over there at MyAx. Mr. Matt, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing over there from a vol futures perspective, as well as what you guys are up to from an overall volume perspective over there at MyAx these days? Yeah, thanks, Mark. It, it, Spike's futures continue to, to go well. The uh, volume remains strong, market quality really strong. And I think the um, you know since I was last on the show, the key development has been you know more new, different market participants entering into the market, uh, greater diversity, um, greater, you know, more of the end user type of clients um, using the product. So that's great to see. Um, and as we're heading into 2022, the, the, the key development that we'll be watching in the early part of the year will be the emergence of uh, Volatility ETFs that have spikes futures embedded within within them. So convexity shares has two products in front of the SEC awaiting approval, uh, a one X long product and a one and a half X long product. So these are similar to you know, VXX and UVXY. Um, expect approval from the SEC in January. Products perhaps launch in. February, and that really completes the spikes, futures, options, derivatives ecosystem. So um, we're very much looking forward to that. The more ETPs out there, the better for everybody. Let's go on out. Jim, I know you're more of a skew, charm, and vanna guy than you are on the vol futures surface, but anything catching your eye out there in the world of vol futures since the last time we chatted, sir? Yeah, and like you mentioned, uh, we're much more looking at fixed strike vol than we are floating. Um, to kind of our listeners that kind of don't don't focus on it as much the fixed strike really being on that kind of the option side where 
where, you know, where that's sliding to, um, you know, fixed strikes has been, uh, you know, pretty muted given the moves recently, um, you know, uh, and, and part of that is, is because you had a higher skew. Um, what I find interesting is that was the case, you know, up until very recently, that skew in the S&P has come down dramatically. And so, um, you know, I, I, I could see there being now higher spikes into declines, um, you know, involved. So, you know, from here, uh, you know, it's, it becomes harder to do things like put spreads and whatnot uh, with skew uh, flatter in the options, which is likely to have a, a bigger effect on the VIX futures um, into decline. So, um, you know, I, you know and, and you could have a, a, you know, a reversion of that skew really increasing some of that, uh, you know, convexity to, to ball performance on the downside from here if, if we get uh, declines from here. Mr. Meatball, same question for you, sir. Anything catching your eye out there in the volatility term structure these days? Yeah, you know, we have been holding a, the term structure has been holding Tango pretty well. Um, we briefly got into backwardation last, uh, uh, a week ago, two weeks, two Fridays ago, but uh, it's been pretty much, despite the up and down moves, it's been a pretty stable 21-ish around the VIX between 19 and 21. And the fall futures, which are December's now heading into expiration, I'm really interested in what, in how we expire and what happens for the next couple of days because uh, a December 22nd expiry, we have one day of trading and then we have the holidays start. And I'm really, really interested to see how that plays out with everything going on in these markets uh, and, and whether we're, whether they're just going to absolutely spike the spikes and the VIX uh, lower early next week, especially if we manage to get green today. Uh, it could be a, a VIX. We could see Vault have a complete bloodbath over the next couple of days if the S&P can get uh, into positive territory today. And we're, as I'm, we're talking, the NASDAQ just went from down 100 to up 30 uh, over the course of five minutes. That's what Vol views is for. We're here for turn Vol, if nothing else here on the show. Let's go on out now to the world of Vol options. Let's start in Spikes land because there was some action since the last time we chatted here, listeners. A little bit of adjusting over there coming into uh, today's show. We're seeing some different strikes. Lighting things up out there in Spike. Still going out next week, mostly December. We got number five. Let's just do a top five really quickly. We got the Dece 20 puts, number five. Number four, the Dece 18 puts. So once again, that a little bit of put action, followed by the Dece 21 puts. So not quite just the call vertical versus puts the way it used to be. Now we have uh, three puts, followed by the Dece 24 calls for number two, and taking the top spot out there in Spike's options right now, the Dece 30s. So a little bit of a smorgasbord out there. Mr. Matt, I know when you're not watching the futures, you're watching Spike's options, sir. What's catching your eye? And can you break down this trade that went up on Monday for us? Yeah, it was a decent-sized trade. In in, in total, it was uh, 6,800 contracts. Um, and a portion of the trade was closing uh, uh, closing a position that was put on in uh, back in November, and uh, another portion of the trade was initiating a new position, and, and the new position is essentially a uh, December twenty one thirty call spread uh, versus uh, buying the December thirty uh, de- buying the December twenty one thirty call spread versus buying the December eighteen put, and there was a pack done as a package. Uh, for a debit of a dollar forty nine, so essentially that that position that's left heading into these expiration uh, is in the money if spikes settles uh, below sixteen and a half or above twenty two and a half. Which, and as you mentioned already, we're kind of right in the middle of that. So we'll see what happens uh, over the next few days heading into expiration. We shall see indeed as we keep on rolling out there to the big dog, which is VIX. Looking a little bit bigger this week even than last week. The ADV skyrocketing these days. It's over 700,000 now, 711,000 to be precise. That's up another 18,000 from this time last week. I can't recall the last time outside of the mad days of 
last March, perhaps, where we saw the ADV get to these levels. I mean, just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, listeners, it was threatening 400K in the other direction. So big change as we saw this Omicron vol squeeze in there and maybe squeeze back out. Uh, so yeah, 7-Eleven is the ADB right now. And today, looking like it's going to threaten it again. Already 458,000 contracts on the tape. Will we see the worm turn out there today, like the meatball was saying? Will we see vol come crashing back in? If that's the case, you can expect to see even more paper in the latter half of the session. Let's break it down out there right now, see what's lighting it up. Last week, as you'll recall, listeners, for the first time, potentially ever, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, certainly, since we've seen that as well. And in, in the top 10 positions out there in Vixland, they were all puts. That's the first time we've seen that in quite some time. Usually there's at least a call or two to be found somewhere. And that is the case this week. A few calls have fought their way back into the top 10. Again, it makes sense. We have seen a little bit of resiliency for Vol over the last few sessions. So it costs you 129,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in Vixland right now. They get you to the D's 40s. The first of two calls in our top 10. Number nine, a buck 42 of the D's 30s. And then that's it. The rest is all puts <laughs> all the time. Number eight, a buck 50 of the D's 19 puts. Number seven, a buck 50 as well of the D's 20 puts. Uh, number six, 157,000 of the December 15 puts. Number five, our first of two Jan positions, 161,000 of the Jan 18 puts. Number four, back to D's, 165,000 of the D's 16 puts. Number three, our final non-December position, we have the Jan 19 puts, 202,000 of those. Number two, 225,000 on the December 17 puts. And rounding out the top 10 this week, the Dece 18 puts, 261,000 of those bad boys. Total of about 9 million contracts open out there in Vixland right now. By 5.4 million or so on the calls and about 3.6 million on the puts. Let's dive into some action really quick out here for the week. Today, like I said, 458,000 contracts on the tape, so a pretty robust day. The most active contract today, get this, listeners, you'll like this one. It's the March 60s. <laughs> of course, that was everyone's first assumption, was it not? 57, almost 58,000 of those already on the tape as of a few minutes ago. Listen, number two, 28,000 of the D's 20s. Number three, 26,000 of the D's 30s. Number four, back to March, the March 30s, 26,000 of those. Could we have a March 30-60 ratio vertical going up out there today? I'll have to dig in a little bit to find out. And rounding out the top five out there this week, we got 25,000 of the Dees, 24 calls. Yesterday, a little bit more paper on the tape, 519,000 contracts to be precise. The most active contract yesterday, 45,000 almost exactly of the Dees 18 puts, followed by 41,000 of the December 19 puts, 40,000 of the Dees 17 puts. Number four, we have the Jan 25 calls. So there were some calls to be found yesterday, 20,000 of those. And rounding out the uh, top five yesterday, we had the Dees 20 puts, 15, almost 16,000 of those. Wednesday was the most active day of the week, at least so far, but today's on pace probably to beat it. Wednesday, 627,000 contracts on the tape, 69, almost 70,000 of the Dees 18 puts taking the top spot on Wednesday, followed by number two, 48,000 of the December 20 puts. Number three, 48,000 as well. Of the December 19 puts number four, 45,000 of the D's 20 calls. And rounding out the top five on Wednesday, 31,000 of the December 17 puts. Tuesday, also pretty active. Really only one day this week that didn't do a lot of paper. Tuesday, 587,000 contracts on the tape. Number one on Tuesday, 79,000 of the December 18 puts. Followed by number two, 78,000 of the Dees 19 puts. Maybe some roll actions and verticals going up there. Number three, 42,000 of the Dees 21 puts. Number four, about 40,000 of the December 20 puts. And rounding out the top five on Tuesday, 29,000 of December 25 calls. Typically, most days, except for it looks like Monday, we have one call at least fighting its way into the top five every day. Monday was the light day of the week. Only 387,000 contracts. We've already surpassed that today. The most active contract on Monday, 36,000 of the December 17 puts. Number two, about 31,000 of the D16 puts. Number three, 27,000 of the December 20 puts. Number four, 23,000 of the December 18 puts. And Monday, again, being the only day where it was all puts all the time. Number five, 17,500 of the Jan 25 puts. Mr. Meatball, any of these crazy positions lighting it up out here on your radar this week in VIX options? And also, how many of these... March 3060s, did you buy today, sir? Uh, well, that was not me. Uh, you know what was really fascinating is, and you and you you hit this when you're going through stuff on the 14th, which I believe was Tuesday, which was the day before the Fed. Market get absolutely ugly, 
and we have puts out pacing calls 1.2 to 1. Uh, the there's not a lot of appetite for you know upside volatility in VIX itself. They they I think they're actually heading straight into the indexes rather than using the the VIX to hedge off that volatility. That's partially because implied vol's high, partially because VIX already in the 20s. But it, it was definitely interesting that we saw uh, the ratio of puts the calls the way it is and. Yeah, I mean, we're we're the VIX is over 23, and you've got 70,000 of the 18s and 19 puts trading. It it was we've got a lot of traders setting up for vol to fall, and I don't know if this is possible. You know, we talked about this. It, can we get a downside gamma squeeze in VIX if it start if if it starts to fall and we start hitting some of these heavy strikes, or is it because of the nature of the of of it being Tied to futures that you don't get the same kind of of push lower, uh, you know, kind of interested in whether something like that can happen. Uh, I think we've seen it maybe once, but that's really what's kind of blown me away. Uh, Mr. Jim, I know you don't watch the VIX options too closely, but if anything caught your eye this week, have at it. And then B, what about this thought of a downside gamma squeeze in VIX, sir? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think you could very well see that. Um, you know, we do pay attention to the, to the, the VIX options, not uh, actively trade them, uh, but obviously in their connection to the S&P uh, ball complex, we, we definitely take a look. You know, I, our view is kind of uh, broadly, you know, as Mark mentioned, that kind of the ball of all is, is uh, you know, priced accurately at this point. Um, you know, there's less, um, you know, upside from here. Um, broadly, though, vol is, is high. Um, important to talk about, you know, the seasonality here, right? I think, I think, um, you know, you have that big JP Morgan trade on the S&P side coming in at the end of the quarter, which everybody's kind of stopped talking about. But vol is, is about to be very well supplied in, in two weeks um, in index land. Um, and uh, you pair that with an already kind of uh, higher broad volatility level going in. Uh, to end of the year, I think the other flows that we don't talk so much about in here, which uh, you know aren't ball specific, but you know there's 500 trillion dollars of, of long assets in the world, and and uh, you know it's up from four, 420 uh, just a year ago. So there's about 80 trillion dollars, you know, coming into the uh, you know in the market this year. Uh, a good chunk of that chunk of that's likely to get allocated Jan first, right? So um, there is structural support. And this market from that into the end of the year, that's a lot of what drives this kind of January effect. Those those things are ball dampening, given how high ball is during this period. You know, there's a reason in that 2018, late 2018 swoon that, you know, that last week of uh, that, the Santa Claus rally still happened when ball's high. That Santa Claus rally tends to be even, even stronger. Uh, and that January effect tends to be even stronger. So, you know, I think, um, you know, ball is a big part of that feedback loop. That is seasonality. Uh, people don't really understand that outside the ball space. But again, you know, the, to, to, you know, hit on my hobby horse, bun and charm, like there is a lot of potential energy in the system for a move higher. I do think ball is likely to, you know, get more compressed here as we get into the end of the year. And there, there are, you know, structural flows that, that make that likely. So, um, you know, I think again, there's, uh, there's, there's, some pain out there, um, but it's likely to resolve higher in the short term, um, you know, into the next several weeks. Should be interesting to watch those flows there in the beginning of January. You're right. I had a chance while you're talking to go dig up this March vertical here in Bixland and didn't go up as a spread. So that is interesting. And it looks like it did go up uh, 13,000 of the 30s. And then at 1042 and earlier, the 60s actually went up all as one chunk about 15 minutes earlier. And those went up late. And then another. 13 or so thousand of the, tw- of the 30s went up about looks like almost two hours later. So weird execution. Obviously, it wasn't done as a straight up ratio type vertical. It is strange that both of those strikes would be trading so close to each other in terms of time. But weird stuff abounds out there in VIX land. That's why we like to talk about it as we keep on rolling. Speaking of weird stuff, a lot of weird stuff afoot. Also, in the world of the ever melting VIX ETPs, perhaps not as not as melty this week as in previous weeks. In fact, or as of right now, VXX is at about 21 and a half. That only puts it up about half a point from this time last week. It was up obviously much more earlier in the session. Today, a pretty robust day, about 233,000 contracts on the tape. We're also seeing this volume effect in the ETPs as well. ADV ticking up 
in VXX quite a bit since our last show as well. It's up to about 317,000. That's up to another 11,000 from this time last week. So VXX putting up some numbers these days. Let's look really quickly what the size positions are out there. Quick top 10. Number 10, 18,000 of the, oh, there's still one pre-split adjusted <laughs> VXX position out there. And of course, if the erosion continues the way it has outside of this past week or so, we may be talking about reverse splits again sometime in the near future. But right now, uh, the VXX1, the the Jan 12 puts are still there at number at number 10, 18,000 of those, followed by number 9, 18,000 of the Jan 20 puts. Number 8, uh, by the way, there's only two calls in the top 10 right now on VXX. One of them is number 8, the D60 calls, 19, almost 20,000 of those, followed by number 7, 20,500 of the D18 puts. Number 6, about 21,000 of the Jan 21 puts. Number 5, 22,000 of the D's 21 puts. Number 4. 29,000 of the Jan 22 puts. Number three, 32K of the Deese 19 puts. Number two, our second and final call in the top 10, 38,000 of the Deese 30s. And rounding out the top 10 in VXX land right now, 47,500 of the Deese 20 puts. Again, the way we're looking today, those are looking pretty good. But uh, if you short a ton of them, which I'm guessing they're not, because it's VXX, people are load up these things to high heaven. So I'm trying to, Trying to spin it to a positive. We'll see. We'll see if this ball erosion continues. We could potentially threaten a twenty handle today. It would be quite a bit, but we've seen crazier things out there. Let's see what's crazy out there today from an action perspective. Not a ton of paper lighting up the tape today. The biggest, most active contract today are the D's twenty two puts, about eleven thousand of those, followed by eighty five hundred of the D's twenty one halves. All this is going out today, by the way, listeners. Number three, eighty three hundred the D's twenty two calls. Number four, about seven thousand of the D's 22 halves and rounding out the top five most active today, about 6,000 of the December 21 puts. Mr. Meatball, it's been an interesting time to watch these ever eroding ETPs. What's been lighting up your tape and the tapes of your crazies in Pitland these days, sir, in BXX? Yeah, I mean, for everything, for all the vol that we've had over the last week, all right, and and this is really the 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 amazing thing. So for all the vol that we've had, since the beginning of really the beginning of let's say starting on the 24th of December or of November for all the vol that we've had on the 24th of December or of November VXX opened 2140 closed 20 and a 2055 right now it's trading 2144 you have not made a stinking dollar being long this thing uh and and there's a reason because of vix term structure if you want to trade these trade them in a day uh trade them for quick pops if you try and buy and hold some of this stuff uh you are going to get your you know what handed to you and you're just going to spin your wheels and as bad as vxx is when we look at uvxy uh, it's even worse. It closed. It closed on the twenty fourth. It opened sixteen thirty six. Closed fifteen forty one. It's currently fifteen forty eight. You went absolutely nowhere. Even if you bought end of day, right before we had this huge ball event, you made nothing. Being long, being long UVXY, unless you traded it. You can trade these. You cannot. Hold them. Say it one more time. Yes, if they've listened to the show long enough, they should have that message beat into their skulls by now. If not, just listening to the the numbers on these names every week should remind them of that. But uh, say lobby, since you mentioned UBXY, let's get to that as well. Then we'll get to some of you crazies, bring you on the show, see what you guys have to say about all this mad vol we have popping off out there. UBXY pretty much giving up the ghost as we've been talking here on the show it was up more early in the session as we're talking now it's almost unched on the week it's up slightly up about two tenths of a of a point so 15 and a half right now so again speaks to what mark was just saying and you know, the upside in these names usually pretty short-lived and uh, when it's when it's going you gotta gotta get out of dodge hence still my regret over not closing out the the short leg of my uvxy put fly from a, a few weeks ago but i digress let's go out out here now to what's lighting it up out there in the UVXY options. Smaller beast out there, obviously. By the way, a pretty active day today. About 191,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the ADV also looking firmer 
up to 213,000 contracts. It's up about 13,000 from this time last week. So that's a pretty hefty number for UVXY. Let's do a quick top five out here. Number five, we've got the Jan Ones. (laughs) These are still pre-split adjusted. So yeah, they're holding on to these. By the time we get to that expiration, we may have to reverse split again. (laughs) (laughs) UVXY, usually around the 10 handles when they start talking about that, listeners. So we are not that far away. Remember, reverse split to 40, 4-0. Not too long ago, listeners. So in insane times we are living in. Number four, 8,800 of the Jan 75s. So talking about the complete polar other side of the spectrum, the one puts to the 75 calls. Number three, 11,500 of the D18s. Number two, 12,500 of the D17s, D70s, excuse me. And rounding out the top five this week, about 13,000 of the D's 15 puts. It may surprise you that there is some upside in there, but as we've seen in the past, usually people have been harvesting on those levels and getting surprisingly decent levels to do so so i cannot fault them for doing that we first noticed that back in september it seemed like a popular trade and it has persisted throughout the rest of the year in terms of the most active trades lighting it up today today is the d16 puts which are now in the money they were out of the money right when we started the show now in the money puts about thirteen thousand of those number two about twelve thousand of the d16 calls number three about twelve thousand as well of the d's expiring next week the 23rd 17 calls. Number four, about 10,000 of the D's expiring this week, 17 calls. So a lot of action on the 17 strike this week. And number five, here we got 9,300 of the December 18s all going out today. Not a ton lighting it up on the single name earnings front this week. We had some names popping off this week. Rivian for the first time. We had FedEx and Adobe yesterday. Uh, we had Leonard on Wednesday. Mr. Meatball, your favorite Darden restaurants. You want to talk some breadstick vol? Now's your chance, sir. Oh, yeah, Dar- Darden Restaurants, otherwise known as Expensive Chef Boyardee. Yeah. No, I, I did not trade around Darden. I got to be honest. How did you resist? I know you cannot resist slinging that breadstick ball, sir. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, do I, I'm not going to go on my Olive Garden diatribe. Uh, I will just remind everybody that if I put bread in a toaster and butter it, you're going to think it's delicious. All bread is good. <laughs> wise words to live by all bread is good except for you folks out there on the atkins that is heresy to you as we keep on rolling right on into the volatility voicemail it's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders it's time to check the volatility voicemail make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, let's get to it right now. Really quickly, our question of the week is raging out there right now. It expires in about an hour or two. So if you're listening live, you can still play along. If you're listening after the fact on the podcast, it may be done by the time you get it on the network. We shall see. But so right now, it's that same question we've been asking you for a while. We wanted to tweak it one more time and put it out to the end of the year. Quite simply, where will VIX close at the end of the year, above or below 20, so slightly elevated or perhaps not so much? And once again, you folks are completely split down the middle. It is fascinating to watch this, which, again, is what makes a market at the end of the day. Right now, coming into the latter portion of the show here, 53.5% saying below 20, 46.5% saying above 20. That's a little bit wider split than we most of the other times we've done this question on the weekly basis. It's usually been 51, 49, somewhere in that range. So you guys are very evenly split on this. Again, you got about an hour or two to make your voices heard. I would ask everybody else on the panel, but we're going to get to that in a crystal ball in a second. So instead, let's keep on rolling. By the way, we have Corey chiming in here saying he thinks VIX will only close below 20 if the majority thinks it won't. <laughs> okay. So a little bit of a little bit of a fade of the crowd out there from Corey. Uh, let's go to this one, actually. This is a good one for uh, for you, Jim, because you love yourself some skew. Uh, Stephen T says, I'm one of those new converts to the options market, and I've been listening to most of your shows for a while now. I recently added volatility views into the rotation as well to improve my understanding of all things vol. Well, excellent choice, Stephen. You are clearly a man of discerning taste. And quite handsome, by the way. I can't see you, but I can just intuit that from your letter here. He says, I think it's starting to make sense for me, except when it comes to the value and impact of skew. 
Should I not pay attention to the SKU index? It seems like Mark is not a fan. Also, what are some of the other things I need to keep in mind when SKU is really high outside of the obvious of not to buy puts? Well, let me just clarify that for a second. My thoughts on the SKU index. I've said it before. You're right. I'm not a huge fan of it. But the reason why is any product that attempts to do this has challenges, which is taking two moving parts, the call wing and the put wing, and condensing them into one number. It's always going to be obtuse, and it's always going to obscure some of what's going on out there. That's my problem with SKU Index, outside of the fact that it's only updated once a day. So it has no real intraday utility at all. It's more of just an indicator. But if you use it as that sense, if you see it's ticking up and trending up and that it's a flag for you to say, hey, maybe I should investigate this more. That's fine. That's a perfectly reasonable use case. I just People get super jazzed whenever SKU Index is, is high, but they don't really know. They haven't done the legwork to see if it's something going on with the calls or the puts that is driving that number. And so that's why... I'm a little bit dicey on it. But, but Jem, you spend your days watching Skew all day. What do you have to say here for our clearly discerning listener, Stephen T., who wants to know some things you should keep in mind when Skew is really high outside of the obvious not to buy puts, sir? Um, yeah, so the, the Skew index is, um, like you mentioned, not only looking at the call and put wing and the combining them, which is, which is not a great tool, but more importantly than that, it's looking at money notes. And the way most market makers and most dealer sophisticated participants look at SKU is, is via delta sticky SKU. So probabilistically, based on ball, you know, what delta, you know, the, the one standard deviation. And that's kind of how it tends to move in the most mean reverting way. I know that's a complicated concept for kind of your average listener. But the point being is there, there are some embedded flaws in looking at moneyness when you're looking at SKU, which I think is a major problem. If you do look at delta sticky SKU, um, and really get a uh, can get a clear eyed view of, of where skew is. It's actually quite mean reverting. So when you see high levels or low levels, it tells you a lot about positioning in the skew, uh, you know, across you know four four dealers, and that itself is very very uh, telling. Um, again, when when skew is high, it's uh, you know broadly means that far out of the money uh, puts are, you know in the market are. Uh, are short by dealers, which leads to more of this kind of buyback of Delta, which I think is, is, is very important to understand. It's also easy, oddly, to hedge when SKU is high. Why is it easier to hedge? Uh, well, when SKU is high, you can buy ball cheap. So put spreads, things along that, that line are, are actually easier to hedge. So ironically, um, there's a reflexive support to markets when SKU is high. Um, and uh, again, I know that's counterintuitive to a lot of people, but, but watching that SKU and understanding what the positioning is on the on the tail is, is very important to understanding kind of dynamics and flows. Um, and, you know, if you regress that skew, a delta sticky basis relative to returns, you get some really interesting results. So something very important to look at and to understand. A difficult concept to squeeze into five minutes or so here, but uh, a great question nonetheless. We'll obviously uh, keep discussing skew here on the show because it is a component and a big component of everything else we talk about here on Ball Views. But now it's getting to be that time, listeners. The most difficult, dare I say it, the most dangerous portion of the show. It is time. The Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into The Crystal Ball. All right, listeners, you know what that song means. It is time to bust out The Crystal Ball and attempt to wrestle with the volatility gods for another week. We have a double challenge this week because next week, Christmas Eve, no show next Friday. So we have to go out two weeks, which pretty much lines up exactly <laughs> with our question of the week right now, which is will Vol close at the end of the year, the 31st, which is two Fridays from now, above or below 20. So let's look really quickly before we get there. Let's pay off our prognostications from last week. Last week, it was myself and the Rock Lobster. Both of us were feeling, shall we say, a little bit lower on the vol front. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster was sub-16, 15.99. I was a little bit higher at 16.35. A spoiler alert, we are not there. <laughs> Coming into the end of the show, we have Spikes back in the teens. Spikes was at about a 19.85, 19.84 or so right now. And Vix Cash just at about a 20.75 or so. So Spikes in the teens, Vix not so much, but Nowhere near a 16 or 15 handle. So no love for us. Let's see what we had really quickly run down some of our listeners. If we had any bullseyes here, uh, 22, that looks all right. Better than some of the others. Oh, 21.3 
for Supervix. I just love that handle, Supervix. <laughs> so he's one of the closer ones. Still not within our tenth of a point a margin of victory. Mensa looking twenty sixty five. Actually, actually not bad. Mensa, you're about point one two away. We'll see. I'll have to discuss with my producers. I'll highlight you and see. That's pretty close. Uh, let's see. 1920. Let's go to some of our chat folks. 16 and a half for Frank. No love there. Uh, MU 1865. No love there. 19 and a half for options, Queen. That's not terrible given where Spikes is. Uh, 1984. You're within the ballpark, at least. Closer than I was. I'll give you that. And uh, Louis. Oh, 17 and a quarter for Luigi. No joy there. A bunch of other. No, bunch of other prognostications in the teens. I don't see anybody with a really 19 or a 20 handle here. So looks like it was a challenging week for all of us. So that means no winner this week. So we spin it ahead to two weeks from now. Let's go around the horn. Let's start with Mr. Matt. Sir, you got a double dose here. Uh, first off, if you have a vote in our poll, which is will Vic slash Spikes end the year above or below 20? And then as a corollary to that, if you have a prognostication for where we'll be in two weeks' time, sir, how about it? Um, I think it's going to be a quiet, quiet high holiday season. Um, so I think we're going to. Uh, I think spikes will settle the year under twenty, and I'm going to call uh, eighteen half for spikes end of the year. Eighteen half. Oh, so a little bit of a. You never know. Those last day or two of the year, anything could happen. They're crazy. It could be very thin markets. So that's, that's what throws another monkey wrench into these end of the year type polls. When it comes to Vol, things are a little bit crazy at the end of the year. Uh, so, Mr. Meatball, speaking of crazy, first off, I have bad news for you. I just was informed by our chat that the Darden CEO stepped down. So I'm sure you'll have to pour one out for him. You'll be very sad to hear that news. And then, B, more importantly, what are you feeling for this time in two weeks from a Vol perspective, sir? Yeah, I'm bummed no show next week. That's that's uh, that's a huge bummer. Uh, I will say, well, I got to bet against my book. So I'll go 29-29. 29-29. All right. <laughs> Mr. Meatball, clearing out the upside there. Like I said, I lost this week, so I deserve to go last. So let's go on out to Mr. Jem. Mr. Jem, it's been a while. Since you played this game, so hopefully you remember, we gave you a, a more challenging task this week. You have to go out two weeks now, so pretty much pick where Val will end the year. What are you feeling for two weeks from now, Mr. Jim? Fifteen ninety nine. So uh, Ooh, I like it. See some some real compression here going into the end of the year. Um, again, that J.P. Morgan trade comes right at the end of the year. Um, there's you know it gets front run by. By all the the ball managers out there, um, you know, on top of that, those big positive flows I mentioned coming from equity land, uh, you know, are kind of immutable. There's a lot of stress out there, um, but you know, this potential energy of ball being higher also is likely to, you know, give us a little uh, Santa Claus rally. So, um, yeah, on the on the low end. Yeah, listener just just recommended a great Twitter thread all about the impact of that role. I have yet to check it out for myself, but it does seem interesting. So fifteen nine, you know, I thought I was going to be maybe the low man on the totem pole, but uh, Mr. Jem undercutting me. I was thinking more of along the line of a seventeen handle. I'm going to say seventeen twenty eight to end the year. So it looks like most of us outside of Mr. Meatball, who says quote unquote he's fading his book, are below the twenty handle for. The end of the year. So that's where we fall in our poll, listeners. All right. That music means an hour flies by when you're talking Vol. Mr. Jem, glad to have you back on the show with us today. But before we go, if folks want to check out what you have up your sleeves and maybe learn more about Kai Volatility Advisors, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, check out my Twitter feed, Jam uh, underscore croissant. A play on my name and then uh, our our you know website kaivolatility.com uh you know happy to you know have have anybody kind of stop in we do a webinar here uh once every month or so here going forward so anybody wants to learn about our products uh you know just hit us up via the comment section on um either dms or a comment section on our, our website 
I'm still liking that volatility food-based sumo battle, uh, the jam, the croissant versus the meatball. <laughs> I'm thinking we could do something with that. I'm just workshopping that. Think about it. Let me know what you think. Uh, my, my take will be a modest 46%. How about that? That's so that yeah. just, just, just to get things going out there, just for coming up with the idea. As we go around the horn, since I'm involving him in a sumo match, I might as well let him go next. Mr. Meatball, sir, what do you think your odds are in that sumo match? And B, if folks want to hit you up with their own ball questions, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, Jim. How, I forget how uh, you're. You're what? A good six, 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 seven. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm five eight. It'll, it'll work out great for me. How can I lose? <laughs> it's all. It's all a yeah, frame no, of mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, five eleven. But we'll. You know, it'll be a fair match. The, the, the bigger <laughs> guy doesn't always win. So, you know. Uh, all so right. You're, you got some some trick stuff behind your sleeve. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm known for my trickiness. You have been training uh, <laughs> with Taker lately, so that could help you. That's true. Uh, so, hey, guys, you know, I'm writing a VIX blog every day, laying out some some what I'm seeing, what's trading, and, and how I'm interpreting. Go to optionpit.com and read the VIX edge. You'll be happy. Oh, Luigi's claiming I snubbed him. The uh... Oh, I thought that pick was for this week, Luigi. You're 17 and a quarter for, for two weeks from now? Oh, then apparently I did snub you by .03, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I pulled an Andrew. I didn't even know it. All right, and you know where to go to find out more about all things Spikes, myxoptions.com. Slash Spikes is the place to go to learn more. We got to get on out of here, but don't worry. If you listen to live, you want more in the old ear holes. We'll be back in a little less than an hour now to break down the crazy week of unusual activity probably do some live trading too it always manages to sneak in there on options oddities you want to learn more about that you know where to go the optionsinsider.com slash secret club and we'll be back of course for most of our shows next week no ball views on friday unfortunately don't blame me blame the markets and we're back again in two weeks to round out the year with another episode of volatility views is brought to you by Myax, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. Myax is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.